The Baroque Age begins around 1600 and ends in roughly 1715. Perhaps no building in Europe epitomizes this movement more than the Louvre. Here in Paris, Louis XIV constructed a palace and then later moved on to Versailles. What he left behind, of course, now houses one of the greatest collections of art in Europe. Of course, between the end of the High Renaissance in around 1520 and the beginning of the Baroque in 1600, a good 80 years has passed. Baroque is the term used to describe the visual arts of the 17th and first half of the 18th century. The word actually originated in the subsequent neoclassical period and it was used negatively to describe anything that was the opposite really of classical art and Renaissance art. Whereas the Renaissance and the classical period was concerned with harmony, balance and proportion. The Baroque period was concerned with the antithesis of this. The Baroque period loved diagonals, loved curves, loved excess drama and passion. A great deal of Baroque art is religious art because one of the stimuluses behind it was the Counter-Reformation. So the Counter-Reformation is the Catholic Church's response to the Protestant Reformation. Prayer, meditation and spirituality are really at the core of Baroque art. And a lot of Baroque art is trying to overwhelm the senses. The spectator becomes intensely involved in these paintings, sculptures and also architecture. As an art movement, it encompassed the idea of wholeness. Previous to the Baroque period, uh, Renaissance paintings uh, tended to emphasise the idea that a painting was made up of separate parts, each of which in itself was, was a perfect part. But Baroque painting emphasised the idea that uh, it was the whole image which mattered. So Baroque uh, imagery is very much more dynamic than uh, the earlier forms of image uh, that we see in the Renaissance, but has not yet become refined to the point almost of prettiness that we see in, in the Rococo. Like many other periods in the history of art, Baroque art is the product of a rich and complex history. The result is that the art of this period is not limited to one style. Another important characteristic of the Baroque was its diversity. The Baroque period encompassed artists as diverse as Poussin and Rubens. Also artists such as Caracci and the sculptor Bernini. Baroque painting found its feet first of all in Italy and above all in Rome. Its origins lie in the work of three painters who were drawn there by its collections of art and its wealth of art patrons. They were Karachi, Poussin, and Caravaggio. Anibale Karachi was born in Bologna in 1560 and was a member of a family of talented artists who founded the first modern art academy in their home city. This was a significant development in itself. For the first time in the modern age, art techniques were formally taught to students. Karachi himself would prove a master when he moved to Rome in 1595 to take on a monumental commission to fresco a ceiling in the Palazzo Farinese with love scenes of pagan gods, as described by the Roman poet Ovid. It would be a seven-year labor that would make Karachi's name. Just to execute such a work on this scale represents an enormous achievement but the actual figures depicted by Karachi are especially significant. 
they rekindle the classical poise and harmony of the human figure and are free of the stylistic distortion of form that characterized much of the Mannerist art of the time. Karachi was an anti-Mannerist who sought to return to the classicism of the High Renaissance. One of Karachi's finest religious works, The Virgin Morning Christ, shows his dramatic use of light and shadow, which secured his position as one of the great Italian painters of the early Baroque period. Karachi's work would become widely known, both within and beyond Italy, and his landscapes would prove influential on the second of Rome's great painters, Nicholas Poussin. Born in 1593, Poussin was French, and his long residency in Rome had broad and long-lasting effects at home. Indeed, it was the King of France's aim in first setting up the French Academy of Art to guarantee him a supply of work, for which Poussin proved the model. Poussin was influenced by something which was known as the pastoral idyll. The pastoral idyll had its origins in the classical writing by a figure such as Virgil, who in his Eclogues and Georgics described verbally a specific type of idealised classical landscape. It was this idealised classical landscape that Poussin was to tra translate visually. Poussin was drawn to the classical period probably because of its philosophy. He was particularly interested in Stoicism and the kind of intellectual challenge which a philosophy such as Stoicism could bring. Poussin was primarily concerned with the suppression of emotion. When we think of the Baroque, the name of Poussin often springs to mind. Here we are at the Birmingham City Museum and Art Gallery with a fine example of his work, Christ Healing the Blind at Jericho. Poussin has tried to emphasize the story by bringing his figures right into the foreground space and placing the key dramatic gesture right in the center. Notice the way in which the hands have been idealized and given a perfected proportion. The figures are balanced and harmonious and dressed in classical clothing. Above them is the landscape, likewise, given a geometric precision and perfection. All the scene in front of us is filled with idealization and perfection. The architecture, the landscapes, and the figures. But above all, Poussin tries to convey to us the intensity of the experience when a blind man first sees. And to this end, he's given us some unusually strong colors. If Poussin's paintings, in their idealization of nature, pleased the viewer, his student, Claude Lorraine, was to take this one step further. He began to leave behind the elaborate telling of stories and myths, and to concentrate just on the landscape. Here we have landscape with a sacrifice to Apollo. So there is a narrative, there is a story to this painting. What's happening is that the father of Psyche is sacrificing at the temple of Apollo with a priest to find a suitable suitor for his daughter. But these figures are all very small in this painting. Anybody commissioning a Claude painting would know that although they might have a subject, they would get Claude's individual treatment about it. So they would be mainly a landscape format, and Claude would be interested in recording the colour and the atmosphere of the event. Claude very often organised his landscapes in a similar way. You would have framing devices on the side of trees or of buildings. In the middle distance you might have a road or water and a bridge. In the background you would have a view of distant mountains. And these distant mountains would always be tinged blue because of atmospheric perspective. So the blue haze that comes across distant objects. The term poetic is very often used about Claude, and I think very justifiably so, because they are very poetic evocations of the atmosphere of a classical antiquity. 
So his was not a classical antiquity of the Roman Empire and of conquest. His was about a pastoral idyll, a pastoral recreation of an ideal world of the past. The third of the important Roman painters of the early Baroque was born in 1573 in a small northern Italian town which would give him the name by which we know him today, Caravaggio. Like his compatriot Caracci, Caravaggio moved to Rome as a young artist and quickly became known, not just to fellow artists and patrons, but to the magistrates and officers of the law. He was temperamental and with a propensity for violence that, in 1606, led to his being charged with murder. It was perhaps this strong character of Caravaggio's that informed the sensuous illusionism in his paintings of religious subject matter. In a Catholic country like Italy, the church was the biggest art patron, and it actively encouraged the production of religious images. The Council of Trent, of 1563, Catholicism's response to the Protestant Reformation in Northern Europe, sanctioned the creation of popular visual art to convey the message of the scriptures to the laity. The Protestant churches, as we shall see, were much more reluctant to commission works of art. But in early 17th century Rome, religious commissions provided the main source of income for artists and Caravaggio was no exception. When the young Caravaggio came down from Milan to Rome, he met a young collector of art who offered Caravaggio the opportunity to come and draw from his collection of classical sculptures. What Caravaggio said in response to this invitation is very telling. What he said in effect was that it was the people around him, here in the city square, that were really his models. He had no need, as it were, of the idealization of the human figure that was found in classical sculpture. This striking way of painting directly from life really required a new word, and so they started to use the word naturalism in order to distinguish it from the realism of the late medieval and early Renaissance periods. It had nothing to do with idealizing the figure. It wasn't about looking at classical sculpture, but it looking at life and painting directly from life. It didn't matter whether it was the low life of Rome, it was suitable for Caravaggio's painting, and so he used the vagrants and so on around him. But to that he added the most astounding dramas of lights and darks, of raking lights that come into the painting and act as if the scenes are illuminated by the light of God. All of this warts and all in a highly naturalistic style. Caravaggio's Flagellation of Christ, painted in Naples while he was actually in hiding from the murder charge, further illustrates his naturalism. The characters in his paintings are able to interact with the viewer. He does this by the use of look and also by the use of dramatic gesture, gestures which seem to invite the viewer into the narrative and into the mood of the painting. Despite his critics, Caravaggio stuck to his style, and of all his work, his conversion of St. Paul best illustrates his genius. When we see the conversion of St. Paul, what we get is a very stark, in a sense, almost an ugly image, an image of people in their harshest aspects and we see a very stark light shining down onto the figures. Caravaggio, as a typical artist working in the Baroque period, was concerned with involving the audience in his, in his images. He wanted his images to be accessible. One of the principal techniques which Caravaggio used was his creation of dramatic effects of light, where he contrasts very dark shadows with brilliant bright light. Often light would illuminate a figure's face to give the impression that it was almost magically coming out of a field of darkness. It creates this very strong 
theatrical image. This then is a, a very much more emotional and intense moment than could have ever been depicted in Renaissance painting. And it's moments like this uh, that the Baroque painters and Baroque art excelled in. Although Caravaggio died relatively young at the age of 37, having managed to avoid a murder conviction, his work would have a profound effect all over Europe, particularly in the Catholic countries of Spain and the southern part of the Netherlands, known at the time as Flanders. His enthusiasm for depicting man, warts and all, would prove inspirational to Baroque artists, even if it was not popular with the laity. In Italy, Baroque architecture was more in the service of the church than the state. The vast scale of some Baroque projects, such as Versailles, could be intimidating, inhuman, and lacking in emotional warmth. Here in Rome, however, Italian Baroque architects, such as Bernini and Borromini, had a different set of concerns. They were working for the Catholic Church, which at this time was actively projecting a more popular image as part of its counterattack on European Protestantism. Here at St. Agnes by Borromini, the architect has found new ways to make monumental buildings warmer and more intimate, and they did this by drawing the spectator into a drama of space and light. In architecture, Borromini has used opposing forms. One is solid and heavy, the other is light and fluid. And neither is it the flat surface drama that we found at the Louvre. This is a deep spatial drama that draws the spectator into the space to participate. Notice, for example, how the dome has been brought forward on the church so that it becomes part of the facade, but a facade that's very deep and modulated it's sculpted in space, as it were. The design of this church is filled with ovals and curves that give the building a dynamic shape. Look particularly at the towers. They're extremely novel for the time. This deep spatial drama was meant to draw the spectator in. And yet, at the same time, it still projected the monumentality, the power, and the dignity of the church. If Brock architecture set the stage for a theatrical production, then Bernini found a way to do it with sculpture as well. This is his fountain to the four river gods. In it, we can see that he's used monumental figures. But unlike Michelangelo's David, these figures are full of power and energy. He tries to find a style which mixes emotion and motion. The sheer force which Bernini is interested in conveying. He's interested in drama, he's interested in passion, he's interested in a complete lack of restraint. He, he creates this effect through the use of the contorted pose, the use of volume, and the, the use of a variety of twists and turns which create a sense of exaggerated and heightened movement. This fountain is an excellent example of Baroque theatricality. In fact, it's no wonder that this is the age that gave rise to the opera, with its rich mix of dance, music, singing, and acting. Much of Bernini's work was related to the continuing building of St. Peter's in Rome from the previous century. Bernini blurred the boundaries between sculpture and architecture to draw the spectator in. Perhaps the finest example of Bernini's work is another sculpture that can still be seen in Rome. It is the Ecstasy of Santa Teresa. One of the problems that Bernini faced was how do you show the spiritual? Because the spiritual is interior, it's within the soul. So you have to exteriorize it. So you show the spiritual by facial movements and by gestures. 
So we can see that St. Teresa is swooning with this pain and underneath the drapery that, that she lies on is agitated and jagged. So obviously that indicates the action that's taking place. Bernini wanted the whole thing to seem like a theatrical event. Bernini also uses light, as Caravaggio did, to denote a divine event. So he uses the actual light of the exterior wall of the chapel to come down on gilded beams to show the divine experience. By the time Bernini's greatest work was completed in 1652, the Roman masters of the early Baroque had made a substantial impression elsewhere in Europe. As early as 1603, works by Caravaggio were shown in Spain, at Seville, which was home to a four-year-old boy who would become the greatest painter of the Spanish Baroque, Diego Velázquez. Almost from the start of his artistic career, Velázquez announced his allegiance to Caravaggio, but with his painting The Water Cellar of Seville, a canvas from 1620, he has omitted from Caravaggio's naturalism its drama of religious revelation. As in the great Italian's work, the figures depicted are specific down to the last detail, although unlike Caravaggio, Velázquez's intention is to portray a scene from everyday life, subject matter that would become more widespread. Indeed, in Northern Europe, as we shall see, artists were able for the first time to create wonderful, compelling images of subject matter which was ordinary even to the point of the mundane. In Velázquez's early works, it is also easy to see that he had been strongly influenced by the use of light and dark, the dark manner of Caravaggio. But as his career developed, his art increasingly looked for a realistic interpretation of nature as he saw it and he used a more subtle shading of light and dark and a more glowing color to breathe life into the subject. He disliked the overdrawing, as he saw it, of the Renaissance masters. And rather than study the ideal figure, Velázquez sought to understand the language of light. He concerned himself more with the overall effect of the piece in its totality. He loved visual realism, and felt some of the drama of the late Italian Baroque to be insincere or unnecessarily mysterious. He wanted to paint the world before his eyes and to convey this to the viewer. And with his portraiture, a branch of visual art that especially thrived in the 17th century, he achieved his aim. Velasquez's marvelous ability to depict living humanity in his work is evident from the earliest years of his artistic career. Appointed court painter to King Philip IV at the remarkable age of 25, it would be his portraits that would secure his fame. A typical example of his skill is the image of Pope Innocent X, executed on a trip to Rome later in his career. The dignity of Christ's vicar on earth is obvious, as one would expect in a papal portrait commission but the pontiff as painted by the great Spaniard is still undeniably a man, a mortal of flesh and blood, something alive. But his group portrait, called Las Meninas, produced after his return to the Madrid court, remains for many critics his greatest achievement. Las Meninas means the ladies in waiting. The painting itself is a scene in one of the rooms in the Alcazar Palace in Madrid. What we have in the centre of the painting is the princess, the Infanta Margarita, about five years old. She's surrounded by her ladies-in-waiting. One of them's curtsying and passing her a drink of water, and the other is on the other side as if to speak to her. We have also some of the court dwarves sitting on the right-hand side. One of them is kicking a dozing dog. And behind them we have two other attendants. In the doorway, we have also another court official spying on the proceedings. There are two other figures present, but they're seen in reflection. These are the king and queen, King Philip and Queen Mariana. 
they actually occupy the position that we, the viewer, occupy. And at the side, on the left-hand side, we can see Velasquez painting the picture, painting the portrait of the king and the queen. So it's a very complex, constructed image. The Infanta has come into the room to see Velasquez painting this picture of her parents. But then when we look at the whole painting the other way round, it in fact starts out as a self-portrait by Velasquez himself, because the painting of himself could not have been done without him looking into the mirror. So the idea probably came from himself painting a self-portrait and then conceiving the notion that one could introduce the other figures and make a much more complex image. Now Velasquez was keen not only to be a great painter but to be seen as a great courtier and a great gentleman as well. He's extremely friendly with King Philip IV of Spain and later on the king intervenes personally to get Velasquez a knighthood. Now Velasquez was one of the palace chamberlains, so a position of responsibility. So you can see at his belt he's got a key. This denotes his responsibility in the palace. But also on his chest you can see the Red Cross of Santiago. That's the mark of nobility. He's not made a knight until after this painting is completed. And one old legend said that the king himself painted this cross on Velasquez's chest as a mark of esteem and friendship. The first half of the 16th century saw the artistic ideals of the Baroque influencing not only artists in Spain, of whom Velázquez was the most notable, but also the Spanish-controlled regions of Flanders, corresponding roughly to present-day Belgium. One artist in particular synthesized these different influences in a truly remarkable body of work, Peter Paul Rubens. Born in 1577, and brought up as a Catholic in an influential Antwerp family, the young Rubens decided to become an artist. To pursue his career, he moved to Italy in 1600, and during eight years of travels, he studied the work of both the Renaissance masters and the early Baroque artists, such as Caracci and Caravaggio. By the time he returned to Antwerp in 1608, he had acquired a large painterly vocabulary and an artistic vision that were to make him a favorite among the courts of Europe. Two years after his return to Flanders, Rubens created his first great work. In The Descent from the Cross, Rubens creates a sense of drama and theatricality via a creation of tension in the muscles of Christ. He creates tension between muscle that is extremely taut and then suddenly shifting to muscle that is dead and flaccid. He also creates a sense of drama through his use of the contorted body, the twists and turns of the legs and the arms. The anguished, contorted pose of Christ it seems to be designed to create a highly emotionally charged response in the viewer. But his mastery of anatomy and enthusiasm for depicting the human body, such a vital innovation of the Renaissance, was not restricted to the male anatomy. His treatment of the female nude can be seen today in Munich with his Rape of the Daughters of Leucippus, a work that announces its Baroque credentials with its exuberant handling of light, its marvelous rendition of fabric and skin, and the sense of space that seems to surround the tightly wound protagonists of the story. Possessed of an aristocratic upbringing, and a gentlemanly tact, intelligence and charm, Rubens became a very influential courtier and painted for many important monarchs, including the Spanish rulers of Flanders and the kings and queens of France and England. Now, if his charm opened opportunities for new paintings, it is the paintings themselves that still charm today. As a master of color, he created a powerful impression of vitality and movement Rubens was interested in arousing feeling in the viewer and his use of diagonals, his use of 
gradation of tone, his use of placing emphasis on specific details of the muscles, such as on the torso. He was confident that he could quickly impart life into any subject and said of himself, I have a magic skill in making anything alive, intensely and joyfully alive. And with his classic self-portrait of 1639, we can see that his skill extended to the representation of a confident older man. But he also clearly loved to paint the soft, luminous flesh of women, the glinting armor of heroic figures, toughened hides of animals involved in the fray. We can see all these characteristics brought to bear in his depiction of the lion hunt, which he painted in 1617. Rubens painted all sorts of subjects, religious paintings, mythologies, allegories, and portraiture. But the lion hunt was a violent subject, and in his own lifetime he had a reputation for being uh, very expert at these kind of subjects. It's important to remember that Europe at this time was plunged in conflict and struggle. The Thirty Years' War goes from 1618 to 1648. And we know that Rubens himself recollects that on his travels around Europe, he saw corpses on the road and herds of pigs running amok. So if you like, violence and pain and terror were never very far away. Very many of his friends, many of the noblemen, often had menageries of wild animals uh, which were um, considered exotic species. So that Rubens would copy the drawings of these creatures uh, and then incorporate them into great expressions of painting. The lion hunt is a dramatic subject where the lion it itself is giving a very good account of itself. I don't think we're sure if it's going to be killed or not. But as in many other Baroque paintings, the whole thing is tremendously agitated and tremendously dynamic. We've got lots of diagonals. We also see that the composition of the painting barely contains all these figures. They're almost bursting out at the seams. They weren't really meant to be realistic images. They were almost glorious pageant paintings, but they expressed a kind of um, a sense of horror for people. But Rubens was clever enough to keep the, the sense that it, it wasn't a, a kind of sense of macabre sensationalism. It was more a kind of gleeful, uh, exuberance within this idea of wild animals, people fighting, swirling around in a great battle scene. A painter of Rubens's greatness would undoubtedly have thrived in any artistic environment. But to the north of Rubens's Flanders, in Protestant Holland, the situation for the visual artist was very different to that of Catholic Europe. Holland had shaken off Spanish Catholic sovereignty in 1580. The new Dutch ruling classes of the early 17th century were iconoclasts. They disliked Catholic image making and considered it a vulgar display of pomp and grandeur. Significantly for the welfare of the artist, Protestant churches urged their congregations to approach God by reading the Bible rather than looking at art. They avoided commissioning visual art and interpreted such images as idols forbidden by scripture. In this situation, artists increasingly had to look for new sources of patronage. With the burgeoning of the Protestant church, altarpieces and decorated church ceilings were no longer required. Dutch artists focused instead on portraits landscapes, seascapes, and still life for a growing middle class. This expansion of subject matter would prove ultimately to be a liberating development. Portraiture in particular flourished, and masters of portraiture would not be short of commissions from the wealthy businessmen and trade guilds who dominated Holland's thriving economy. A clear Baroque identity would develop in the works of the great Dutch masters, the first of whom was one of the finest portraitists of his age, 
a man whose most famous work still remains popular today, Franz Halls. By the early 17th century, the young artist Halls learned of the innovations of Karachi and Caravaggio, and through a long working life in Harlem, he applied these innovations, most especially in his portraits of the merchants and wealthy citizens of his community. His mastery at capturing the character of his fellow citizens and his naturalistic, almost casual approach provides a striking record of their emotional life. With Hall's Banquet of the Officers of the St. George Militia Company, a typical commission of his time, he brings about a celebration of life to the canvas. Already a master of the techniques of group portraiture, a genre almost exclusive to Holland, Halls' genius at capturing the personality of the individual officers is even more remarkable. But in his individual portraits, his ability is even more striking, as can be seen in his 1633 depiction of a Dutch merchant, Peter van der Broek. Viewing an image like this, one can almost imagine that Halls has captured his contemporary in mid-conversation. Halls was a remarkable painter of portraits. He seemed to be able to capture that moment in time when human character is revealed. As well, he combined this with a style of painting in which the brush strokes were highly visible. They seemed to be dashed onto the canvas in the manner of a sketch. While in fact they were carefully produced studio pieces, he managed to combine the freshness and directness of sketching with a finished painting. This ability to represent his insight into human character was very much appreciated by his contemporary, Rembrandt. Born in 1606 in the Dutch town of Leiden, Rembrandt spent the bulk of his working life in Amsterdam, where many of his greatest works can be seen today. Such is the volume and quality of his lifetime oeuvre, it may be that his portraits provide the best starting point. In a portrait such as his painting of Jan VI, we can identify his genius at work. You get the sense that this is a real man, a real man who had lived, a real man who had had a whole multitude of experiences, and this experience Rembrandt seems to capture in, in the flesh and in the skin and in the body of Jan VI. The way in which Rembrandt is able to use paint in this extraordinarily sensitive manner brings out the true character and individuality of this man. This uncanny ability to capture the private person, the person behind the face, appears time and again in Rembrandt's portraits. Like Halls, he thoroughly mastered the technical difficulties of depicting several people together. In his famous group portraits, Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Culp, commissioned by the Guild of Surgeons, or the Syndics of the Cloth Guild, a portrait of five businessmen, we see his remarkable ability to contrast the emotions within a group. It's difficult for the viewer not to believe that these Amsterdam guildsmen were once real, doing real things in real space and time. Rembrandt's skill as a portraitist, however, is perhaps best seen in his self-portraits. Time and again, he rendered his own image on the canvas. Rembrandt isn't concerned with an ideal type of beauty. Rembrandt seems to be concerned with the beauty of the individual. He achieves this by paying particular attention to details such as clothing, such as accessories like gloves and hats and hair. And Rembrandt particularly defines himself by the particular look in his eyes and the eyes have an almost mysterious penetrating effect on the viewer. At no point does he ever attempt to present himself on the canvas as anything other than what he was, a physically imperfect man. It is perhaps because of this great series of portraits that so many people feel a close personal affinity with Rembrandt's work.
The late self-portraits are all, always very heavily worked. If you look at the surface of them, they're very thick. If you like, some people have suggested that this thick, obsessive working records the kind of struggle that Rembrandt has to record his own personality. It's often said by some people that these are visual autobiographies. In some senses that's tr true, but there's no direct link between what was going on in Rembrandt's life and the way that he painted himself. For instance, in the self-portrait of 1658, he shows himself clothed in very expensive finery. He's holding a kind of scepter as a mark of authority. So this is quite a confident image. But this doesn't match at all what was going on in his personal life. Rembrandt's de declared bankrupt in 1656, and in the very year of this self-portrait, 1658, his house is sold off, and so are some of his possessions. So rather than showing the changes in his circumstances, this self-portrait of 1658 is about his indomitable spirit. And we have a sense of greatness in this painting, which is much more than we would have, even in paintings of kings and queens and great panoramic images of people. It's a simple man looking at himself, but it's perhaps the most eloquent portrait that anyone could paint. But Rembrandt was more than just a painter of portraits. Unusually for a Protestant country, he chose to execute a substantial body of religious images no less significant than his portraits. In his Reconciliation of David and Absalom, an Old Testament story of a good king and his devious, rebellious son, we can see that, like Rubens, Rembrandt mastered the rendition of the texture of fabric. By strongly contrasting light and shade, Rembrandt captures the drama of the occasion and keeps the human theme of reconciliation very much to the fore. Towards the end of his career, Rembrandt would turn to the New Testament for subject matter to produce his Return of the Prodigal Son, where soft light and soft shadow contrast in a work where the human message is so simple and moving. Rembrandt was also a master of a reproduction technique called etching. This involves taking a copper plate and covering it with wax. With a sharp tool, the artist then draws and scratches through the wax. When he's finished, the plate is dipped into acid, which bites into the metal. This groove is then filled with ink and is transferred onto the paper through a press. This subtle and soft method of making black and white images was exploited for its maximum drama. Later in his life, Rembrandt also produced the famous Hundred Gilder print. In it, we see Christ preaching in a ghetto to the poor and ill. A mother has brought her baby to see Jesus. A rich man has come looking for the key to heaven. On the edge of the image, we see the famous camel and are reminded of Christ's remark that a rich man stands as much chance of entering heaven as a camel does of passing through the eye of a needle. The sheer magnitude of this one man's artistic output was such that his poverty and posthumous anonymity seem almost impossible to fathom. Despite its financial difficulties, Rembrandt was the giant of 17th century Dutch art. But perhaps because of the specific nature of the art market in Holland, he was not the only fascinating artist at work at the time. With the absence of religious commissions, the still-life painting began to grow in popularity, a genre whose greatest exponent was probably William Kauff. Landscapes, too, would provide work for the Dutch artist, and Jacob van Roosdale's view of Harlem takes the modern viewer straight back to the flatlands of 1670s Holland. But perhaps more interesting than these fine works are the creations of the final great artist of the 17th century, Jan Vermeer. If Rembrandt's was the most prodigious output of the 17th century Dutch masters, then there can be little doubt that Jan Vermeer's was the least. Just 35 canvases of his can be seen today, 
including some portraits and landscapes. Vermeer seems to be obsessed almost with the material world as a result of his smooth, polished surfaces, his use of detail. But through his dramatic use of open doors and windows and even kitchen floor space, he, he gives a sense of drama and magnitude to the everyday. A calm approach to the distribution of light, a precise approach to color, and perhaps most significantly, a superb arrangement of space can be seen in images like Young Woman with a Water Jug and The Kitchen Maid Pouring Milk. But it is this elevation of these humble depictions to center stage that form the most significant aspect of Vermeer's work. Although some critics suggest that Vermeer is not, in the strictest sense, an artist of the Baroque age because of his use of the camera obscura, it can still be seen that his work is in many respects a culmination of Baroque realism. In looking back, perhaps there were three different ways in which the Baroque artist conjured both the invisible and the visible. Firstly, the noble and virtuous classicism of Karachi and Poussin conjured an invisible and perfect world. Secondly, the confident and dramatic dynamism of Bernini and Rubens conjured an invisible and theatrical complement. Finally, it was the naturalism and realism of Caravaggio, Velázquez, Rembrandt, and Vermeer that captured the visible world and recorded the deep fascination with nature and human nature, which emerged so strongly at this time. It was an age that produced some of the greatest landmarks in Western art.